Welcome to yet another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. This is part two of my conversation with Meghnath. Please do check out part one before moving on to part two. In this part, I talk to Meghnath about merits and demerits of democracy, how we can make it better, reservations, looking back at the last 10 years of the government and all different aspects related to propaganda, or as Meghnath loves to call it, fluffaganda. I get to grow as a person a lot during this podcast, but it also involves a lot of research behind the scenes. So I would be really happy if you could support the podcast with a cup of coffee on buymeacoffee.com, link in the description. Do share and spread the word among your family and friends too. So without further ado, let's get into the conversation. Now, now let's move on to democracy, uh, right? Yes. Uh, so, so democracy is very, very popular. Uh, you know, there are so many different kinds of government, if I can call them, uh, that people have tried or people just did not have a choice and it just happened. Uh, oligarchy, autocracy, dictatorship and whatnot. Uh, in your opinion, is democracy the best solution or just better and there are there is something better out there interestingly enough i've been trying to ask myself this question for years now about what is the next form of democracy or system of government or system of organization so the more you go down into the basics of what a democracy is supposed to do the more you realize what you're doing right for example uh, what is the point of a democracy right uh, humans are social animals right uh, we need organization that this society needs to function towards a particular goal for the overall betterment of the society you know building a bridge one dude can't do it 100 people can right so when there is a organizational structure put on top like a manager who is sort of directing them in one direction planning executing plans telling people what to do that's how a bridge is built right so how does a country get built or how does a country process or progress, right? That's democracy. It's that system of government where the government is essentially directing citizens in a way uh, to go in one particular direction, right? Um, that can be done overtly by just telling people what to do, right? Or stopping people from doing things that they're not supposed to do. Or it can be subtle, which is incentivization, right? We want to increase our manufacturing sector right? The government can essentially incentivize the possible potential businesses from coming in and opening factories by doing a few things. You know, they can give land subsidies so that they can actually buy the land, build a factory, all the things. Um, they can give incentives in taxes. You know, they can give incentives in trade, right? You know, like export duty, import duty, they can control. Um, they can help them get market access by building roads, uh, by having like a infrastructure built around the supply chain, uh, cold storage, all the things, right? Uh, so all of these things are, are are what the government can do to spur on, let's say, a particular sector. This can be applied to social justice as well, right? For example, when it comes to uh, reservations, right? Now, they can see in the socioeconomic data, um, they get socioeconomic data and then they see that there is a particular community that is being left behind, right? So they identify why they are being left behind. What are the possible intervention areas where policy can be made, right? Like, uh, you know, it can go range from atrocities, stopping atrocities to also getting them promotions in jobs or getting them jobs uh, into positions of power right or an education so that is where reservation comes in so the government can do all these things now the democracy part of it is this which is how does this system get built right the system gets built because people as a collective want it that way a, for a system to function for a leader to actually run that system, or I'm just talking about, let's say, a manager right now, um, the people he, he or she is controlling also need to trust them, right? So there is an inherent give and take of trust happening between the person who is running the system and also the people who are affected by this or are being are uh, are a part of this. 
once that trust is established things start happening if that trust is absent things don't happen right you can get trust in two ways one is you can actually convince people that hey this is the right path let's go in this direction and then you vote for it right or the other is fear right which is you scare them into it right so again different styles of functioning so if you look at democracy it's the first uh, option right which is like you convince people you tell them through di dialogue discussions voting that listen this is the path we need to go on are you okay are you convinced about this okay then vote for us and we will take you down that path in an autocracy that is absent the dialogue is absent it is mostly like giving orders and expecting people to follow it uh, so these are the two forms of government largely which is better right for people who are not in power right we are both not in power clearly very democracy. limited power yeah we will both be like yeah yeah i want to have a say i i don't want to live in that autocracy i want democracy <laughs> so it is the best form of government just in, between the two of us we will agree that uh, we need to have a say in government we need to know where we are going and we need to also have some sort of opinion about it which maybe the government is listening and also course correcting right yeah i mean in 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 democracy i think mostly it's like the majority wins right obviously that's the simple logic uh, with, but with, agreed mm -hmm. but majority will be also on on different scales right just to explain a majority can be an identity based majority which is like hindus yeah uh, it can be a party based majority you know cpm you know like a lot of people are cpm members so they vote for it it can be right ideologically driven however you want to call it it can be completely based on the fan following of a particular person you know mgr jayalalitha modi fan clubs vote for them this fourth issue based majority like for example if you look Kaveri. at the news right now kaveri is one but like look at the caste census hmm. right okay. caste census will form an issue based majority so if that issue based majority decides to vote collectively that's also a majority so when you say the majority wins it's not necessarily a bad thing right it can just it's just how you look at the majority if it's a conservative uh, majority which is completely using their identity to coalesce into a group and vote for it and then also ensuring that this group and only this group benefits from the government in existence that's a problem that's a that's a dangerous majoritarian rule at the same time if it's an issue based thing like even the caste census for example what happened in the 90s right which is the janata dal movement um mandal commission that was an issue based majority that they formed like loose coalition of uh, different identities coming together for one issue hmm yeah that 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 makes sense so i think i think the the best way is have a democracy and if there are missing gaps just keep on plugging it and keep yeah. on improving it right that's yeah Probably... So the the good thing about democracy is also that it allows for this, and that's also a feature, right? Which is essentially incremental changes have to be made. I mean, if it's a giant country you're running, right? Ah, uh, you need to have very well thought out policy decisions. Again, not it can't be hundred percent ever. You will go wrong. You will go right. Sometimes you will go wrong. But at the same time, what democracy allows is some room for experimentation, which is you do pilot projects, do like incremental changes over a period of years, right? So government is stable. Government as a government is perpetual. People running the government keep changing, right? But the government policy can remain the same. Uh, a lot of the things that BJP is doing today. Congress has tried it before. UAPA, which is being used against journalists today, was a Congress thing. Like Chidambaram is the one who made it, right? Sixty-six A, which was uh, used to clamp down on um, you know people who are speaking online, was a Congress thing. BJP used it, right? Uh, uh, Congress used to bring in ordinances all the time. You know, without passing in Parliament, they would bring in laws. BJP just made it worse. I mean, worse in the sense they're using the same tricks, right? They're just doing it in a much better way. Um, even if you look at 
स्वच्छ भारत अभियान सैनिटेशन स्कीम्स राइट सैनिटेशन स्कीम्स हैव बीन इन प्लेस सिंस द 1950s मिड 1950s राइट टॉयलेट बनाना है this government is not the first one to think of it last one was not the first one to think of it the one before that wasn't the first one to think of it that policy is perpetual which is toilet banana hai we should stop open open defecation no matter how long it takes right we are finally at a point where we can see that we are close to that target it took us literally 70 years to do it and that was only possible because the government was perpetual and it was like yeah ye karna hai you know like the, so the people might change they might repackage the same ideas in a different way and sell it as their own but at the same time the government knows what it's doing and democracy allows these incremental changes yeah yeah i i i completely agree and and to your point about reservation right um, i mean the upper castes obviously hate reservation they are not in favor of it hmm. um, but but with your experience in the field uh, have you have you noticed that it works because i mean i'll i'll tell you a common narrative that the apocasts uh, say is that you know reservation is not going to the right people uh, it's not going to the deserve deserved people mm. and uh, another common narrative in uh, in colleges is that hey you know uh, this person is an scst and he has a apple iphone uh, mm. whereas i come from a middle class background uh, and so on so like overall looking at it uh, have you noticed that reservation works uh, and what have been your you know some of yeah. the things that you observed like success stories or whatever two things right i've been asked this question multiple times and i always tell them you also use this word narrative you know this is all anecdotal evidence right just because the dude who sits next to you has an iphone and has a different background doesn't mean that everybody has an iphone right uh, and also what is the problem with him having an iphone <laughs> also right you know like why do you have to go to his identity maybe his dad worked hard to give him that iphone and it's completely fair right uh, in a in a place in a country where uh, the system is very broken right you throw money at people bribe people and you get in right um corruption is going to be there corruption is an intrinsic part of our society greed is an intrinsic part of our human soul yeah um, think about it this way right so these anecdotal evidence evidence nahi bolunga anecdotal hmm. narratives also come in because there is no evidence so if you are saying that reservation has worked has not worked it can be both of our experiences right i would say that i have seen people who got into the ias who came from very uh, backward backgrounds and they are doing a good job i know a few people some of them are my friends who are in like um, irs ias etc and they're doing doing a great job right some some are district collectors some are doing other things i have worked with uh, politicians who came in because of reservation right and who got elected because their seats were reserved um and that is also fair right um they are also effective in their own way so i can give you anecdotal evidence of how it it has worked also right you can give me how uh, anecdotal evidence of how it has not worked plus you have to understand where this is coming from right because i have interacted with so many people who have benefited from this and i can see how they are adding value right i can bat in favor of reservation because you haven't seen anyone like upper middle class usually cloistered you know like just a bubble right uh, which which i also come from honestly um wahan pe this narrative is very strong because they do not interact with people who have benefited from this they only see the people who come on their radar and usually they are rich people right they are the people who made it to that circle or that economic level or hierarchy power hierarchy um they might or might not have used reservation doesn't matter they are there right so you are looking at them but they don't go to like bastis right they don't go to like even they don't talk to their maids right they don't even let them share the same glasses for fuck sake yeah. you know like i mean that has i've seen that in my own house and it's it's horrifying then it's like talk to these people no talk to the people who genuinely need reservation and ask for their opinion right that that is super absent and the unfortunate thing is the underprivileged they can never set the narrative 
right because the power hierarchy is a, a, a dictate that the upper caste powerful moneyed people economically well off people will always set the narrative so this anecdotal narrative is what you hear a lot because it's a lot of privileged people setting that narrative the dalits the people who actually need the reservation the people who are living in poverty the people who uh, it, during the g20 there was this curtain put up the green curtain there are videos that came out of those people saying that what what have wrong have we done you know like why can't you see our faces right talk to them about reservation talk to them about uh, you know like manrega or or free bus rides people who need it right i don't need free bus rides but they do right their opinion matters <laughs> but unfortunately nobody is setting their narrative and when you try to do that it sort of also upsets a lot of power structures right it threatens people economically narrative wise politically you are working hard to set this narrative which benefits you when something comes in to challenge it you immediately push back right the thing is all of this is being done without data especially when it comes to reservation so this caste census which is happening bihar biggest example we can see now which is um about 80 uh, how many 15% are upper caste privileged people so 85% people are getting 50% reservation and usme bhi divided into like 27% 22% whatever right uh what if it, it's according to the numbers what if yeah what will happen right it will cause a political earthquake for sure it is giant social engineering also but at the same time you can see the argument there which is uh, what rahul gandhi said for example uh, 90 secretaries in the government central government three of them are obcs how did that happen right if you if you extrapolate bihar's population to like the entire country clearly there is at least more than 65 70% people who are obc yeah our tribals sc st included everything non upper caste right uh, what happens to them right and do they only deserve to have three officers who are controlling 5% of the budget it's a very big question right and that can only come with data add a layer of socio economic data to it right which which the bihar government might release soon rajasthan has said it will also do it karnataka has said it will do it odisha has said it will do it and now more states will want to do it because this question that you asked right which is did reservation work answer is we don't know maybe it didn't right and then we have to figure out why it might be one reason uh, which is which is which might, which might match with the anecdotal reason also that only a few people have been able to benefit from this reservation policy and enrich them right but there are a large amount of people who should have gotten it and didn't get it does that mean reservation is bad or does that mean it's being implemented badly so then we fix the implementation right or it might turn out that oh reservation has changed the socio economic uh, standards of so many people right then that is definite evidence that oh maybe we need to scale down the reservation then right we need data to make either of these decisions we don't have it now i hope we do <laughs> yeah yeah very interesting point i think i, I was talking to mohit satyan and uh, and uh, you know for one of my episodes and he he made a recent trip to bihar and he was saying that he met people uh, who were waiting for their you know teachers uh, high school teacher appointment for like 4 mm. years mm. that was that was insane you know some of the some of the things no, that absolutely. i heard from him yeah uh, especially eastern up and bihar it's it's definitely a difficult situation and to your point about uh, treating maids and having separate gl- glasses i was i was talking to this uh, michelin star chef about you know the restaurant culture and uh, the behavior of uh, patrons uh, in the restaurant and they sort of don't have that uh, line that hmm. that servers are, or waiters are just as equal uh, as us hmm. and and he was talking to me about this difference between service and servitude right uh, hmm. they are there for service but you know don't expect them uh, you know don't expect servitude from them so that was yeah. that was also an interesting point and i i see you tweet a lot about the whole g20 saga yeah um, yeah where 
like you mentioned, uh, green screens put uh, and people were not even allowed to be on their terraces. Um, mm. What is your take on it? Uh, you know, let's say international leaders are coming to Delhi uh, for a for a conference. What difference does it make if they see the the reality versus they don't? Uh, does... You know, the answer is very simple for this. Look at yesterday's news, like Israel Palestine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you make like fluffy statements. What is the point of the G twenty? Get all these 20 countries together. Now 21 with the African Union also in it. Um, Get them together. You know, talk about a bunch of issues over a year. Environment, climate change, trade, cooperation. No war, but all of these other things. Uh, Then come to a common minimum agreement that oh, we decide to do this. When you have something like this, a forum like this, and you're coming to a common minimum, uh, it is bound to be extremely generic. Mm. Right. It will always be, oh, yeah, we will protect human rights. We will protect uh, freedom of speech. We will uh, advance democracy. One nation, one democracy, one nation, like, you know, one brotherhood, whatever. Right. All these generic ass messages, which is like, just like, uh, it's like a wish list. Yeah. (laughs) That's what G20 is. It's a wish list. Right. How are the countries individually working to fulfill that wish list? That is a question. Now, I can compare this with the sustainable development goals, right? Now the UN SDGs, right? They have like this uh, 20, 25 point agenda about removing poverty, right? Now the thing is they are actually telling you that, oh, by 2025, you have to target this. And this is based on our data, right? So it is giving like a definite target to the country. And it's not like the country can't can't like have any opinion on it they are also saying no this is too unrealistic this is what we found this is what we can achieve etc now what the sdgs ensure is that collectively a bunch of countries are moving towards one target right g20 may do you have anything of that sort no they haven't come to an agreement with the carbon taxation they haven't come into come to an agreement about uh, even trade Right. They haven't even come to an agreement about whether to support Ukraine or Russia, let alone, you know, like whatever. Like, I mean, who is right? I mean, in a war, you have to take sides. Can you be neutral? I guess you can because it's G20. Right. You know, you can you can just be on both sides and you can get them on the table and you can do like fluffy statements together. Um, In this background. Right. Uh, I know like a lot of, uh, you know, international affairs people will get upset with what I'm saying right now, but it is the truth. Yeah. Diplomacy for the last decade, right, has been extremely random. It's completely dependent on very, not isolated, but big incidents that happen all over the world, right? COVID was a big diplomatic nightmare for a lot of people, right? You know, like... Uh, can countries have like people coming in and out, right? Oh, you'll have to give, go to Belarus, pe allowed it, then se you can go somewhere. Holy shit, right? You know, it's like that's diplomatic nightmares and how it looks like. Can anybody predict whether COVID will happen? No, right? So international affairs in a lot of ways now has become random, right? Israel-Palestine happening yesterday, literally. People are taking sides. Modi ji gave a statement saying we support Israel. There are people who are like, oh, but Palestine ka kya hai? They are under occupation, right? For years now. Did you see the map? Right? Just since the 40s to now, how it has shrunk and how... Did you see the videos of how basically their water supplies were cut out, etc. But then they will point towards the gruesome terrorist incident that happened yesterday, which is horrifying, right? You know, the, the images were very bad and horrifying. Now people are like, oh, Now Israel has to fight back, right? Then does Palestine have a right to fight back? It's a question worth asking then, right? So now our policy is based on that, right? You know, whether you want to align with Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, Where do you want to get oil from? Saudi Arabia, Russia, right? Where where do you get it from? We don't know, right? Whoever gives us the best price. Oh, will you do it? Do trading in dollar or do you want to do it in rupees? If you do it in rupees, will but it is pegged to the dollar anyway. You know, you know what I mean? It's absolutely random. Mm. That's what I think about the G20 in general. Now, coming to what happened in India, right? It was a PR exercise. It's simply put, right? Elections are coming. 2024. We were supposed to do G20 in 2021. Did you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we didn't do it because we said, oh, we wanted to coincide with our 75th anniversary, which is 2022. Did it happen in 2020? No. 
uh, we went to Indonesia. We said, let's swap. For what reason? We don't know. We just want to do it. So 2022 didn't happen. Now 2023. And right before, like months before uh, you have elections, uh, there's this big PR blitz that goes out. Graphs go out about how Modi is the most popular leader in the world. How we are Vishwa Guru. How we are the mother of democracy. Yada, yada. I'm actually doing an episode on this. Uh, so I'm doing, uh, so I've, I've started doing the series called Modi Review, uh, where I'm documenting everything Modi ji has done in the last 10 years, uh, just for a documentation purpose also, but also like telling a story of sorts. This is my big crux of the next episode, which will be out next week, I guess. Uh, what did G20 do? And are we really a Vishwa Guru? If we are a Vishwa Guru, a world teacher, what is it that we are teaching the world? Right? It's a question worth asking. Yeah, other than Modi flexing his muscles against uh, Trudeau. <laughs> I mean, see, that's the thing, right? You know, I, like if we are calling ourselves Vishwaguru, right? How can we become a Vishwaguru? Let's let's think about that, right? Um, uh, two ways. You know, I, actually, uh, Jay Shankar gave a statement uh, a few few months ago uh, on Smita Prakash's podcast, S. Jay Shankar. He was asked, uh, what are we doing with China? Why aren't we taking action against him? And he's like, it's the bigger economy. Do you want me to pick a fight with the bigger economy? Do you know what will happen after that? So it might sound like, are ye kya bhar gaye, defeat ho gaye. No, he's being realistic, <laughs> right? China is the bigger economy. China has a lot of uh, trade control around the world, right? Um, if China stops trade with India, we are screwed. I mean, it's as easy as that. Um, so that that means they're the Vishwaguru. They're the ones who are teaching the world how to essentially do trade and do things. So the only way for us to become a Vishwaguru is to also become a bigger economy so that people don't mess with us. That's that's a very realistic way of looking at it. The other other thing to do is increase your military, which is Russia, right? America, right? Their economy might be shit. They might have like manufacturing problems, whatever Pakistan. problems. Pakistan, yeah. Doesn't matter, right? You know, if you have a big army and you're able to flex that army, Israel. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy, right? You know, it, so two ways to become Vishwaguru. Are we either of those? No, we aren't. Maybe on the army front more than the economy front, right? Our army is huge. Our army is very capable. Our army is extremely well trained, right? Um, we have some weapons, thoda sa maybe arms and ammunition department we need to improve a little bit. Other than that, there is like proper patriotism, you know, into everyone. Like we support the army, everybody supports the army, etc. Right? So if if a country attacks us, we will retaliate and we will retaliate well. We have that going for us. Can we invade another country? That will make us a Vishwaguru for sure. Right? Do you want us to invade another country? Probably but not. we do dream of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like this China, Canada thing that happened. It's an allegation that that Justin Trudeau made. That uh, yeah. assassination. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. So what do you want to do now? Like, uh, do you want to... Admit it. Do you want to say that yeah, yeah, ghar mein guske mara. That guy was a terrorist. We are powerful enough to now go to other countries and on their sovereign soil do these activities which are not okay according to Canada. Right? Are we saying that now? That we have like this very effective spy assassination network which can just enter countries and kill people? <laughs> make up your mind right that will make us a vishwaguru also to be honest right if we legit have like a cia type agency like a raw which is operating across the world destabilizing governments and there is like proof that is put out every once in a while yeah yeah i guess the whole vishwaguru thing comes with disclaimers and conditions apply precisely yeah. so my my whole thing is other other way to do it is economically right you know now, economy-wise, if we become a manufacturing giant, if we become genuinely like a very uh, high-growth economy, something like what Bangladesh is doing right now, yeah. right? Bangladesh is improving its economy by miles. And then it is reflective in their human development index also, you know? Um, if we do something like that, 
and we actually become an economic power that is worth going for that is i feel the vishwaguru category that we need to fit in is it happening yeah that's a question that's a bigger question Hmm. On this whole Vishwaguru uh, thing, I I also noticed that you were you have been quite critical about uh, Modi's you know foreign visits and all of that. And uh, is it important for a country to have this geopolitical mastery or kind of soft power dominance over other countries? Or uh, what have been the top top things why you have been critical about it? It's it's very uh, strange because. you know the thing is with this government there's a lot of narrative mm. there's a lot of anecdotal stuff happening you know when you say that soft power is what what does that mean exactly like you're selling yoga to america is that soft power i mean Kya by soft say? power i what i mean is something like korea right korea with music and uh, animation That's what, uh, yeah. movies not animation but like yeah movies so, and series things absolutely. like that yeah yeah you tell me uh, what you're talking about let's say bts you know i'm a bts fan mm. right and uh, if bts i'm obsessed with bts right you know like, i mean i'm a not but i mean i listen to them but there is an obsession with bts around the world right so korea essentially is promoting them as like some sort of brand ambassadors right that's soft power right what is happening due to that is something we need to also figure out uh, bts is making a lot of money yeah uh maybe the korean government through that is also like getting a lot of money and economy and yeah, but you know, I think, maybe i think other k pop artists you know similar k pop artists are precisely getting, yeah precisely so the other k pop artists are getting recognized so the industry as a whole is growing hmm. right because of this whole cultural uh, phenomenon that is happening around the world uh that soft power is useful right um i want to see what what equivalent example we have in india of soft power right we keep saying soft power uh, about like and, and the first thing that comes to mind with soft power is genuinely yoga which which is this whole uh, yoga day and everything that you know this government has been doing they have been pushing it and even the narrative is like oh this is our soft power what is it doing here you tell me in india yeah I mean, uh, yoga as an industry is developing, bringing more. Always has been. Baba Ramdev existed before the government. I remember going to a Baba Ramdev camp back in Nagpur in twenty two thousand seven eight sometime. An entire stadium full of people were doing yoga. Yeah, and he, he was like charging some hundred bucks, two hundred bucks. Stuff. Hmm. You know, lakhs of people doing yoga. Now it's streaming. my mom does yoga every morning there's this streamer who uh, she's been following for years now right does he care about soft power in america no he's growing because of youtube <laughs> right my thing is yoga was an intrinsic part of india right it has always been in school we have been made to do yoga right uh, everybody has yeah it is a part of our exercise regime it is the way we do exercise it is the way we keep fit right if the western world is picking it up sure right but do we have like something like a bts yoga right which is actually developing the industry making other people come into this field economically there is economic activity happening there because right now if you look at it it is a natural progression is what we are seeing right yoga teachers doing physical classes versus yoga teachers doing online classes yeah it's a it's a function of technology yoga has already been there always been there any other examples of soft power um i mean bringing some foreign investment in india like semiconductor is one you know that that's one that See, i can that's think where, of see that's where that's what i can uh, actually get behind a little bit right but there are two ways to look at it again right uh, make in india Yeah, Make in India was launched exactly ten years ago. Atmanirbharta and all of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So th- they they keep changing names, but Make in India was the first big splash that came, two thousand fourteen, September twenty fifth. You know, like this big announcement. Oh, Modi ji is going to make us a manufacturing giant, right? It was Make in India. So you come in, you throw money at us. We set up factories. We have resources. La 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 la. We make products for you, and you take it away, and you sell it, right? 
so the, we become a manufacturing hub is is what the whole thing was mm-hmm. uh their idea was to grow manufacturing sec- manufacturing uh, in the gdp the share of manufacturing from 16% to 25% right uh, it, it, almost that much right um did they do it no they didn't if they did they would be like proclaiming proclaiming it like crazy like g20 would have become a make in india event then right and i can get behind that if you actually ended up doing it they didn't though right the manufacturing sector has been struggling for the last 10 years for very obvious reasons it might not it might be their fault it might not be their fault i feel like it is because they planned like their plans were garbage in in a world where protectionism trade protectionism is at an all time high why are you depending on foreign investments we are a giant market like we are one seventh of humanity why don't we just increase demand in the market here why don't we put more money in the hands of the people who will circulate that money within india and create this giant market most countries that are currently investing in india are investing it for the indian market Facebook cares about India because we are a giant number of people. Yeah, Apple it's throwing too. money here because that's what it is, right? Mm-hmm. We, the numbers is what they care about. They don't care about what we are creating, right? They care about the market potential here. They care about the number of customers they can acquire immediately. Yeah, why aren't we doing it? <laughs> why aren't we? Why aren't we looking inwards? Why aren't we trying to generate investment within our country, right? And I feel like. if you want to make it a manufacturing hub use our money to make it a manufacturing hub and then try to set standards of maybe foods that become soft power um artist artisan work right you know which is like uh, traditional handicraft textiles we used to be a giant textile giant uh, you know before the british came and destroyed it metallurgy yeah we have resources yep alloys metallurgy metal works everything um there are so many ways to look at it semiconductor as you pointed out right semiconductor ke liye you need extreme expertise yeah taiwan is i would i would say 25 years ahead of what we have here currently unlikely to give us the trade secrets this it's one us way ahead you want to set up a factory here will they do transfer of technology then it's worth it i doubt it though because when um, iphone set up a manufacturing plant here did they do transfer of technology no they just set up a plant they're selling it to the world yeah it's always designed in california manufactured in manufactured China. in india yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, do you think india is already ready for that kind of radical shift in manufacturing i feel like the attitude is what is important yahan mm-hmm. pe you know this atmanirbhar bharat thing um as a intrinsic idea is great but i feel like it is being communicated in the wrong way atmanirbhar means like as i pointed out that we need to also develop some technologies innovate etc even if i'm not saying that we develop the next iphone right that is that's not what i'm saying i am not saying we should develop the next semiconductor right we, we i'm not saying that either i'm saying let's make like a uh, let's make better roads which can be copied by other people yeah like uh, that too we can do yeah let's have better transmission systems yeah uh, let's have some metallurgy research going in india which we can focus on which will create alloys that are cheaper better durable whatever else you need the properties that you need right um things like that so indian innovation needs to be really encouraged but for that you need a very basic thing which is change in education uh is our education system changing are any policies being made which will actually maybe let this happen 10 years from now are we looking at that horizon uh i would say the delhi government is the delhi government don't don't get into like whatever they are doing but at least i really appreciate the fact that they are teaching business skills to kids yeah they are giving them like 8000 rupees uh, or 2000 rupees per child and uh, you do whatever you run a business with this they group together so they found this like kids are coming together as a group bringing in this corpus fund starting a business together they try to do like a shark tank version of it also yeah in delhi government 
like it. literally delhi government sponsored program where these kids are coming and pitching to vcs and manish sisodia and two other vcs and they're investing in it and it's i really like what what it was because i was very interested to see what products these kids are coming up with you know what they were coming up with mostly craft and handicraft hmm. like you know uh, using like jute to make like this amazing lamp with a very fa- fancy led light inside you know it looks very pretty they wanted to make this uh, the other is batteries you know like portable batteries uh, solar charged back batteries uh, things like that right um, exercise equipment do you know it's very fascinating right because these kids found a void right they found what they are good at and they were like isko market karke dekhte hai kya hota hai right uh, clothes yeah designer blouses whatever it is right um the my thing is that our, our schools are not teaching this enough right which which we really really need which is like to sort of poke kids into being curious and experimenting in business yes but also in the field of science also in the field of liberal arts right i feel like that sort of attitudinal change needs to happen which is unfortunately nobody is thinking of it hmm. yeah i mean shashi tharoor in one of his interviews was saying about just people coming out of college uh, in india it's it's that you know they have learned so much in school and college but the whole employability or skills yeah. that is required for the modern job market is uh, quite lacking and i think i think it kind of shows in a lot of industries that is being set up is like like for instance uh, chennai is the saas capital of the world is was what people say you know software as a service um, do you think with with manufacturing in india there is this not so much of an emphasis on quality but uh, but because maybe because uh, india is such a price sensitive market the the focus is mostly on being cheap and mm. and not premium quality and maybe that is what is not making us compete in the world uh, what's it's, your it's uh, uh, no i would actually argue the other way around which is mm. uh, if you the examples you mentioned are mentioned are all in the service sector Right. right we leapfrogged when the british le- we leapfrogged from an agrarian economy to a service economy we skipped the middle which is manufacturing right so we went from uh, you know having raw material growing raw material a lot of people growing raw material to just Im- exporting people you know which is human resource right um we might be the saas capital we might be like infosys mein bahut clients aate hai whatever uh, we are servicing we are in the servicing field most of our engineers as you said they are not job ready but most of the engineers are becoming engineers to get jobs that is a problem right most of the engineers are not going in to set up a factory right or or make a product right colleges are not training them to do this either right the reason why uh, a lot of engineers come out and an infosys has to spend millions training them retraining them to do one particular kind of job is because the client needs it right the client is also not in india by the way client is outside also right it's it's a problem and the thing is if you if you have someone let's say remove the service sector if engineers came out and uh, you know manufacturing industries and big industries pick up most of the engineers right and train them into uh, you know whatever uh, they have to manufacture right making the best best product putting in research putting in work right colleges priority will change they will start innovating inside there because the kids will be like if i need to get a good job a high paying job then i need to learn this kind of skill hmm. right now that's not happening right now the most popular field in engineering is computer science for a reason right programming is more valuable than building a lathe machine yeah i mean again no capital right you just need no a computer capital. yeah yeah i mean this is another thing that that was in my conversation with mohit satyanand uh, we were talking about again the same thing and and he was mentioning how 
you know in if 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 in the in a country the government does not bridge that gap the corporate somehow magically finds a way to bridge the gap which is what infosys and you know all these mm-hmm. companies is doing is like they set up a training institute where they bridge the gap essentially uh, make them uh, make them it's a waste up. of their resources to be completely honest then oh yeah for sure yeah colleges yeah. need to be doing it themselves colleges are the ones who should be there should be no need for a training institute right training programs i get like a month program which i did for example for lamp whatever it was yeah right? that's mostly uh, to get accustomed with the system and precisely yeah precisely the base knowledge needs to be the, especially when it comes to engineering right when it comes to uh, yeah uh, getting working into an infosys or whatever it is uh, you need that base knowledge and that should be provided in college it shouldn't be like a separate sort of thing you have to do later yeah yeah very wasteful resource yeah um uh, well uh, i know you might have uh, earmarked a bunch or you know majority of this for your for your content uh, mm. but but what do you think have been the 10 most salient or i mean i'm just not going to number it but uh, some of the significant things that uh, the modi government has been able to achieve uh, do you think roads is one of them uh, Mm. building highways the infrastructure has definitely improved i mean there's no two ways about it um i mean i am a, i drive a lot like i'd go to like himachal uttar uttarakhand uh, punjab uttar pradesh plus i've covered a bunch of elections also here and there uh infrastructure definite improvement yeah thumbs up yeah mm. um i feel like uh, maintaining the payment ecosystem is also a big deal you know the i i'm saying maintaining specifically the upi and how it has expanded again function of government right which is uh, the the idea germinated earlier now it is being implemented properly and kudos to the government for doing this <coughs> right um there are uh, other things like welfare delivery i've seen that welfare delivery has massively improved um ration uh basic needs basic uh, service delivery lpg cylinders all the things that has uh, the delivery has improved right corruption has gone down in that sort of uh, area um all of these things are great things hmm. uh and they are winning because of it right uh, in places like uttar pradesh you, you would hear things like law and order law and order has improved how they did this uh that's a little <laughs> on the fence about it like very shady uh, extra judicial killings everywhere but at the same time people are like this is what we needed we needed to clean up some people so that there is fear in society so that nobody does this again you know it, you it's logic at the end of the day right uh, whatever you want to call it um so there are these few things right which have definitely improved um sometimes they end up getting credit for a lot of things which they haven't done also which is which is a natural progression of the world that is happening uh, spread of the internet yeah spread of the internet is a function of demand at this point of time right everybody knows they need internet everybody knows that uh, there is a chance that the internet will become a reason for them to get more money and a, and a lot of and a lot of it again with the bridging of the gap was done by the corporate right so oh absolutely the private sector did this right absolutely what you are what you are saying right which is the uh, all these small broadband companies etc they their engineers are actually quite smart right you know the people who lay down the network the people who do all the work um, people who set up my modem etc i had one long conversation about fiber optic networks with them they were very smart very knowledgeable they taught they showed me how they like fuse the lines together and everything and that takes some doing huh? and that is i feel like that is one part of innovation that is happening but that is completely because of the private sector right and that is a demand driven uh, you know uh, innovation right fiber optic cables and how to lay them the private sector is figuring it out because they they see business the government is taking credit in a way that oh you humne kiya no sure you exist you're letting it happen you're not actively stopping it right but give credit where it's due the private sector did this hmm yeah that that brings me to this whole propaganda thing right hmm. um you know modi came to power because of what he did in gujarat and uh, 
I mean, again, I was never in Gujarat, but what I hear is, you know, he definitely did some good things in Gujarat and it's one of the most uh, progressive states in terms mm. of like economic development and whatnot. Uh, but compared to the last UPA government, uh, when did you see this whole propaganda nationalism thing uh, start propping up? Uh, did Was it Uri or was it even before Uri? Before, I would say. A little bit before. Uh, I think the thing started right after they got a majority government. Um, you know, I think in the first few years, still they were like a little more on the fence about a lot of things and whatever but uh, i feel like um demonetization right demonetization was a big turning point uh, in the propaganda machinery because till that point everybody is like modi modi yeah doing great whatever like jo bhi kiya great kiya whatever whatever right demonetization was a hair brain scheme scheme right anyone anyone literally anyone who was there in the country during that time must have faced some sort of difficulty or the other, right? For me, it short-circuited my brain. Like, literally. Like, think about it, right? You know what it did. Um, dude comes on TV, tells us that in three hours, the money in my pocket is not worth anything. It blew my mind also because a lot of a lot of my savings and my stashes were cash. Right. Like, I mean, I didn't have a big amount, boss. I was a, like a not very highly paid, whatever. Uh, I had some cash either, either, but for that month, I wouldn't pay rent. All these Delhi landlords want their rent in cash. Right. I had withdrawn a bunch of cash because I wanted to pay my rent and uh, it's just worthless. It short-circuited my brain, not just in that way, but also about whether money matters anymore, right? Tomorrow, this, anybody can come, like whatever, Modi can come again and say, Ki, oh, all the bank balance in your bank is now mine. Yeah, it's just numbers at the end of the day, right? Clearly, he can do anything he wants, right? That is the shift. So I thought that boss, this was a stupid thing he did. Right for two months, people were in lines. They were dying in lines. They were screaming, you know, whatever. But at the same time, after that ended, after people saw how much they have been screwed with, some sort of masochistic behavior came about, which is like, "Nay, Modi ji ne kya watch hai kya hoga? Arey, what are you saying?" So they were forced to do propaganda because of the mishap. That I happened. think they, that gave them the confidence that whatever they do is okay. I feel like it's like it became like a testing ground, right? Almost, which is like even after we make people stand in line for days, even after we take money literally from their pockets, right? And like, you know, there were so many stories of people being found with like three lakh rupees of 2000 rupee notes. How did you get it? One week into dem demonetization when the limits were set, how did these people get it? Right, we were doing this. Um, we we were doing this project throughout demonetization of recording just the AN, ANI news that was coming out about stash of cash being found, new cash, new cash, new cash. About in in just like a month, we found like some three thousand crore rupees worth of new notes were recovered. How did that happen? Right. So in one way, people like me and you. We're getting screwed by our money going away. And in another way, there were these rich fuckers who were just getting money from somewhere. Again, if you look at it objectively, you should be mad. But how unfair this whole thing is. And the whole and sole uh, responsibility of this comes on the dude who came on TV and his party. No, nobody blamed him. Economy literally tanked after that. Jobs went away. Uh, manufacturing went down. Uh, sort of everything was just like nuts. Like businesses shut down, MSME sector shrunk, people lost jobs. Yeah, who blamed him? Nobody. Seems like the voters didn't care. Yeah, and now I think people don't even remember that something like this happened. <laughs> you know, that's the, so that's long. the tragic part. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing this whole Modi review series because I feel like people need to be reminded a little bit about the kind of shit show that this was. Um, 
because you know that's what i said right when if you ask me what good they have done i gave you examples yeah the people even ask me oh but you always point out hmm. critical things negative things about the government right why don't you talk about the good things i'm like boss i'm paying them taxes they're using my tax money to already promote this this is what and democracy more. looks like yeah they they're doing it themselves why do i need to add my voice to it for free right um i will i will question them i will criticize them because nobody is doing that right uh, like and, I, and i'm on your side genuinely like i'm powerless you are powerless come let's ask the questions to the powerful people the basic logic right <laughs> and when you are questioning the powerful people you are not like are you know how amazing you business you know you run your business how amazing your profit margin is so great why would you do that <laughs> yeah exactly i mean uh, so, so this whole propaganda i i i sometimes wonder how they were able to do this uh, does it have to do with you know uh, this whole media uh, hmm. you know m- having their claws on the media regulating the media and forcing them because like like for instance this whole ndtv episode that happened right mm-hmm. uh, uh, someone being asked to create a ruckus in rahul gandhi's press yeah. conference and ndtv i mean he, he, over the years i thought it was more of like a centrist or or more like a con- pro congress mm-hmm. channel and even ndtv doing these things is it is it the media that they control predominantly to uh, propagate their propaganda so so to say to a big extent yes but what is the propaganda is important here right which is um they are using ident they are weaponizing identity you know they are weaponizing identity to an extent where they are creating enemies out of thin air for anybody to hate right um you will see through this whole whatever years right anti national you know uh, way back in 2015 there was something called the intolerance gang hmm. Tukde, right tolerance tukde. intolerance <laughs> before tukde tukde there was an intolerance gang there were some incidents communal incidents that happened during that time uh, not in my name etc was happening during that time before that uh, some people re- returned their awards academics returned oh, their yeah. awards and yeah. then there was this protest and everything so there was this intolerance gang that came about right um, then khan market gang you will remember right that was another thing that used to be there it seems like ancient history but you'll remember uh, anti nationals tukde tukde gang as you said which happened after we that we fear for our JNU. kids we fear for our kids yeah yeah tukde tukde gang what does tukde tukde gang mean yeah when you ask this question to anyone they will be like how oh, they want to separate the country into many pieces who is going to do it tell me how will you do it Right? Is the government going to do it? Are we are we going to have a state of anarchy where the government doesn't exist and we all like uh, you know borders draw कर लेंगे खुद अपने घर के बाजू में and like टुकड़ा this is my टुकड़ा tell me realistically how will you do it right who in the right mind around you right now believes that that is a good situation to be living in right so even if these people let's assume allegedly these people are saying oh bharat ke tukde hone chahiye whatever who is listening to them who will go do it right not, not many yeah uh, who is going to go and do an armed revolution right now like boss i have to pay my rent even i have to pay my rent right everybody has to everybody has to survive everybody has to do their own thing you know like they have to uh, you know raise a family they have to go you know watch movies they want to do everybody wants that life they want good things they want a good life whatever why would someone go and start an armed revolution against the state i don't understand right like armed revolutions are usually started and become a thing when a giant amount of population is dissatisfied right pakistan is a big example i mean everybody keeps pointing to pakistan and how 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 we are better but we need to learn that's not a also. great benchmark <laughs> no it's not uh, look at palestine and israel right you know palestine uh, has been under occupation for a large amount of time uh, water has been cut out people have been murdered kidnapped maimed whatever it is they retaliate right um, in a horrifying way that's an armed revolution happening there right now 
which is like a giant amount of people just don't want this system anymore yahan pe do you see that happening really like exactly my point right you know you can't even there are people here who are lazy enough to not even protest the government taking away their money and you are telling me they will go out on the streets and start an armed revolution against that the is, country that is so true that is so true yeah yeah it's look at the people or i it's very crazy when you think about it propaganda has become uh, crazy to such an extent where you are being constantly reminded of your identity which is a hindu or a muslim yeah the other way around also um then you are being told that you are in danger from who these amount of people took it with gang khan market intelligentsia communists and, and whatever urban naxal what is an urban naxal who knows apparently naxal movement jahan pe hua tha wahan pe there are no naxals anymore and in in delhi apparently there are suddenly naxals kya kar rahe again armed revolution ab kahan pe where right the only people who have seen doing armed revolution right now is in haryana last month hmm. with people running around with guns yeah that's an armed revolution in manipur i'm seeing a armed revolution there oh, is yeah. a civil war happening there right now right so you're not talking about actual armed revolutions happening inside the country right but you are targeting these amount of people who somehow are a danger to the country right i would say these people with uh, guns in haryana are a danger to the country i would say people in manipur mehtes and kukis militants running around stealing guns from police stations and shooting each other are a danger to the country and integrity and sovereignty of india the thing is happening there though right i would say that china invading or like taking over our territory our army fighting back is a danger to the country i would say that china putting out uh, signals that arunachal pradesh is a disputed territory that is a danger to the country i would say pakistan sending in like infiltrators that is a danger to the country these things i agree are genuinely scary things which you should be worried about at the same time if this is a strong government you should also be not worried right because they are handling it they are keeping me safe but at the same time what this government seems to do is create enemies out of nowhere and keep giving me this crisis about being scared all the time right everybody has to be scared apparently everybody has to be scared that their identity is being snatched away from them their religion their identity their places of worship which is also not happening right there are these riot situations that happen where people kill each other right uh, they fight with each other they kill each other they there is like escalation people give hate speeches doing the same thing that i just described situations get scary government needs to clamp down and control that that is their job if they are not able to do that it is the government's fault right shutting down the internet doesn't help uh, you need to actually actively go to like let's say two community leaders from different communities bring them together get their followers together do flag marches with them do they do that of course they don't they want this conflict because you need to be fearful because you need to be suspicious all the time right so that you are not suspicious of the government And that's basically why it's working because people are suspicious of each other they are not suspicious of the government is it is it mostly the think tank who is doing this the or the chelas or the other raja himself i think it's easy so here's the thing right you know the thing is you don't really need much to do this hmm. you just need to have extremely loud people idiotic people like i've done some videos on some idiots uh, you know who go to tv and they do street level behavior now people are going to parliament and doing it but tv channels uh when do, when was the last time you saw a debate which was normal never it's been a while <laughs> yeah uh ndtv comes to mind as you said right ndtv used to do that but now ndtv is also slowly slowly shifting into that right no yeah. noise they they used to be like oh we don't give noise we are muse right i used to go on ndtv uh and i used to like have like nice debates right like different people from different ideologies decent debates right nidhi used to moderate it or sanket used to moderate it um unfortunately 
now news is not news it's entertainment it's like a verbal wwe match um and it's easy why, why i'm saying this nobody needs to do research right uh, and anand ranganathan can go on tv and say like geriatric jellyfish dreaming of a red revolution whatever else right methane spewing urban naxals whatever he gets his 2 minutes he just had to basically sit on his commode and write it down angrily right then he rehearsed it in front of a mirror said it on tv what research do you need you need a word generator now chat gpt can also do it for me i don't even need to do that anymore right it's easy you see th- this is easy to platform this is easy to do and this is entertaining it's like screaming matches are always entertaining conflict is entertaining when you bring in research and nuance into the conversation it becomes boring for a lot of people right um so this propaganda what you're saying this think tank is doing it or whatever no they aren't honestly they aren't right it's just specific- going on a, on its own kind of yeah no they're specifically picking spe- picking people who are good at this all mm-hmm. their spokesperson bjp spokesperson sambit patra sanju verma uh and that gautam bhat gaurav bhati or whatever his yeah, name is right yeah. they are all good at this right they are all good at screaming over someone calling them eh hey, molana chup re eh hey, molana molana really like cat calling like they they're good at cat calling that is their basic requirement right you have to be able to shout over someone you don't have to let them talk so dialogue shouldn't be possible in a tv channel is their basic requirement think about that right and they literally are copycats of each other which means there is literal thought that has gone into this that this is the thing that we have to do on tv actively for all spokespersons mm. i i feel like yeah that need we need to talk about that more a little bit but yeah yeah but i mean the there's this saying right that you can't fool a lot of people for a long time but but it seems to be working you know for for a few years i think at least four five years i mean years now, i yeah. guess i guess there is we have come to a point where mm, i mean where i was getting at was like you can't be doing this for this long uh, without getting exposed uh, no i i i'll tell you why uh, actually the situation is that our country is not doing well mm. you know economically right um lots of people don't have jobs right um i have been struggling for a few years as well right you know people are not spending money people are not hiring people like me people are not hiring consultants like me or whatever it is right um and people are not when they are holding back money it means that they are holding which means they are not investing right so if if the if the population is not spending much the economy is bound to go down right they're not buying things they're not spending on things they're not doing this there's a top rich percent of people who are doing it but that's very minuscule amount of people right uh, job creators they call them whatever um, large amount of people don't have this so what is the consequence of this people are dependent on the government and what is the government doing they are bragging about giving ration to 80 crore people that 60% of our population the government is feeding 60% of our population that's not a joke right mm-hmm. when you are completely dependent on the government for your basic requirement and this is a government as I, as i pointed out salient features is good at giving that welfare delivery right at least ensuring that there is money coming into your bank and also uh, welfare coming to your door which will let you survive at a very basic level they are like at least we are alive we have been brought down to a base level mm-hmm. where at least being alive is good enough this whole news click raid that happened a uh, few days ago i cannot tell you how many people messaged me and called me worried right since then every morning i get up i'm like police aane wala hai right because uh, this happened like news click got raided first uh, years ago mm-hmm. and then when i was in news laundry back then we got raided also with it right you know income tax raid hua then again a news click thing happened and we were also sent notices right so it's something like a coordinated uh, something so now in my head i'm like if this pattern re- repeats 
they will raid news laundry i don't work with news laundry but that doesn't matter to them they'll just grab whoever is in the news laundry network raid their houses take my computer away this is literally my bread and butter now right yeah this happened in kerala you know i mean obviously not anything associated with the central government but there was a there was a online news channel and uh, they took computers away cameras away like <laughs> they they they're taking people's phones away computers away everything and think about it me as a youtube creator currently this is literally my my survival right here and every morning now when i get up i'm meri phati padi hai fir hmm i mean there is no way i can not think about this right you know there is no way that i can be like ha ha mere ko kuch nahi hone wala there is no way i can predict anything anymore right mm-hmm. um one example small example i'll give you this has been happening to me for two days right um i have been very vocal as you said about uh, g20 all mm-hmm. the things i put out a few videos of calling out right wing influencers whatever and was a reaction video so i was mostly ha ha he he lol look at these stupid people let's laugh at, laugh at them because i feel like that's what they deserve anyway um now there were uh, their fans that came in with the why would you debate them i'm like what am i going to debate he's calling someone a geriatric jellyfish what am i going to debate right um the other thing that happened is whenever i make the establishment uncomfortable they go back to my tweets they go back years they find something relevant and they find something which is shady and then they bring it back so which happened to me uh I did a tweet in 2012 when I was in Delhi uh saying that dear China if you want to bomb someone uh, if you want to bomb bomb the country please drop the bomb on uh, Delhi because all assholes will die right very edgy very edgy tweet by like a very young 21 year old me who was very frustrated I had an anonymous account back then I had about 100 followers right I had no idea that tweet existed they found it they splashed it everywhere tagged the delhi police constantly for oh two boy. days they have been tagging the delhi police and every time i see that i am scared right mm-hmm. because i have seen zubair being put into jail for a 4 year old tweet which was which was a meme from a movie which was in 1987 based on the complaint of a anonymous account which had one follower wow it was created 15 days before so imagine like now like since two days hundreds of people are doing that i i am I, every morning every day is an existential crisis for me i am thinking of survival I have been brought down to this base level. Yeah, waking up with a panic attack so to speak. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean just before we end this podcast I think you know with this whole uh t- I mean sort of taking taking on the government and mm. their policies and what not uh, other than the odd comments that you get uh, in your YouTube mm. feed uh, have you gotten significant amount of backlash like personally? Yeah there there have been moments you know like the uh, calls coming threats and whatever some sometimes like even you know used to happen sometimes you know people will say things yeah. in public sometimes but very rarely honestly online is mostly what i face uh, mm-hmm. uh again i it is nothing compared to some other people face uh, i mean i'm very privileged right i'm a man a hindu brahmin uh whatever upper caste person english speaking elite khan market person as you call it latin uh, so, from nagpur <laughs> yeah latin from nagpur also from nagpur big advantage yes um and the the amount of oh, money yeah. i get yeah also from nagpur yes i get the reference uh, yeah yeah and uh, my entire family is like associated with the rss hmm. and uh, you know they ana jana rehta hai types you know that whole rhetoric apna hi ghar samjho apna hi ghar samjho exactly so in in this situation i'm like maybe i'll be okay like mm. uh, i am the kind of one of them or at least identity if you care about so much then maybe thoda sa you know the thing is that i'm lucky that way then because there are other people who don't have those advantages and who are getting it much worse 
right uh, way worse than i'm getting so i wouldn't i did, i never really say this out loud that i am being attacked i am being trolled or whatever and i look at it objectively and i tell people also oh, look this is happening right and meri phati padi hai right but the amount of uh, like the fear that i have compared to what someone else might have might be very different right maybe some people are just paralyzed right now sitting in their home right who are not able to get up in the morning thinking of this thing at least i'm able to do that which is like i'm i'm i have like fear in my mind but at the same time i'm able to do what i'm doing it's a advantage i guess yeah yeah excellent uh, megna thank you so much for being on the show uh, and i hope you continue questioning continue asking the right questions and uh, finding the right answers and i hope you know people Uh, respond to you i mean i i wish you all the very best with your uh, independent creator journey and I, thank uh, you I, i can already see the responses uh, people are loving it uh, it can only grow and i'm pretty confident about that so thank you so much Let's and all hope. the very best yeah yes fingers crossed <laughs>